seems like everyone out there, all the most successful people, have all these inspiring quotes about how they've failed, but now they're successful. But let's be real. Who here actually wants to fail? Who plans for that? No one. Because we're out here in the real world, to fail seems like a disgrace. It tells us that we're inadequate. It tells us that we can't live up to the expectations society sets for us. However, I believe our view of looking at failure is skewed. And we need to change that. We need to learn to not be afraid of failure. I'm going to talk to you about how my own personal view of failure has evolved and how this evolution has changed my life. First, uh, I guess I need to tell you a story about myself. And the first thing you and most people notice about me, the wheelchair. You don't have to turn away and pretend it's not there. It's there. So um, it, was, uh, I was, it was 2009. I was 23 years old. And I, you know, was, everything was going well. I had my typical ups and downs in life, just like everyone else. But looking back, things couldn't have been more perfect. I just graduated from the University of Georgia, magna cum laude with honors, with a degree in chemistry. Uh, I was every day how, out having fun with friends, or running, climbing, going to the gym. My goal at the time was to go to medical school, and those plans were pretty much locked in and on track. I did not know, however, that my life was leading to a moment when everything would come crashing down and everything would change. So exactly six years and six days ago, on May 23rd, 2009, my family's vehicle hydroplane hit a tree. The tree came down and crushed me. I woke up a few weeks later in the traumatic brain injury unit of the Shepherd Center. The nurses and doctors told me what happened to me, but I didn't believe them. Uh, the list of injuries was pretty, ro pretty long. However, the most significant of these were that I had suffered a, a severe uh, traumatic brain injury that left the future of my mental state unknown, and a complete spinal cord injury that left me completely paralyzed from chest down. This was in the beginning of the summer, and I had planned on starting medical school that following fall. <laughs> I thought I'd walk again. Uh, Heck, I, I knew just any day now, I would get up and walk out of the hospital. Because I, I, who actually expects or is ready for that they can, we're going to wake up one day and have to accept that life has totally changed? No one expects this. I mean, and this wasn't my fault. I hadn't done anything wrong. While I was there in the hospital, I longed for some things I'd completely taken granted for like the ability to wear blue jeans instead of sweatpants or a hospital gown. And if you don't know why that's significant, try putting on a pair of pants without being able to lift yourself up. It's incredibly hard. Um, when I couldn't eat solid foods and had to eat pureed foods, I longed just for a nice cheesy slice of pizza. I wanted to go out for a run again. I wanted to go walking on a beach and feel the sand between my toes. I kept telling everyone that I had to get out of there so I could start medical school. But no one believed me. For those few weeks in the traumatic brain injury unit, my hospital mates included people who couldn't speak properly, who couldn't think properly. Some even had to wear soft helmets at all times. My best friends would later tell me how slow I initially was at playing simple games, games like Connect Four, that even the little kids can excel in. I was also told later on that my short-term memory was affected. Although I couldn't tell, I thought it was exactly the same. They tell you that after, they tell you in the hospital that after a spinal cord injury like mine, your body will, will recover whatever it's going to recover, whether it be sensation or movement, within that first year. And then after that, your body won't recover much. So after a few weeks of not achieving complete recovery like I had expected, I reluctantly decided to put off medical school for one year so I could focus on rehab. I mean, I, had, I felt like I had lost everything. I couldn't run or swim or bike or go hiking with my friends. I couldn't feel or move anything from chest down. Um, I was actually asked yesterday, why, Hamad, why do you keep holding on to your knees? 
when you talk. I said, well, if I lean forward like this, I'm going to fall over. I can't control anything. It's, I've lost so much. I've lost a lot of my friends. I, I couldn't even go to most of my friends' homes anymore because I can't walk up and down stairs. So I spent most of my time in my bed in my parents', uh, parents home. People looked at me differently and treated me differently. Suddenly, I was handicapped. I was disabled. Some even thought of me as an invalid. I was afraid I'd wear those labels for the rest of my life. Once again, I was young, still young, and no one expects anything like this. But I knew if I kept focusing on the failures and all the things I couldn't do, instead of all the things I still could do, that's all I would ever see. And that's all anyone would ever see. So I had a few things left, very few things, and one of them was my, my mind, in that I had the eventual goal to go to medical school and become a doctor. So I decided I had to keep going. I didn't, I didn't just do it for myself. I did it for my family and my friends, too. Because it would be incredibly hard for anyone to see their loved one affected by an event like this. I had to show them that I was OK, that life goes on. I had to fake it until I made it. So in this most, most vulnerable of times, I decided that this is what I was here for. If I was going to be put in this wheelchair, then heck, I was, I was going to do something about it. With everything I've experienced, I could provide a perspective that few others could. I may not be able to ever walk again. I may be treated as a second-class citizen. I may have to work a lot harder, but I wasn't going to sit back and feel sorry for myself. Because once I went down that route, there would be no coming back. Being in this chair meant that I would have to work twice as hard and accomplish twice as much just to be considered even close to equal as other people. If I had to somehow accept and come to terms with my physical disability that first year, then that second year, when I, was, when I first started medical school, was me battling perhaps an even bigger adversary, my mind. I was scared. I was living completely alone, and living completely alone for the first time in over a year, and I somehow had to, had to deal with this disability. My grades slipped. I was studying so hard, but nothing seemed to stick. My retention of information was poor. If you know anyone who's gone to medical school, and I think still here we have the president of a medical school in the audience, they can tell you that medical school is incredibly hard for anyone. But I was studying so hard, but nothing was seemed to be working. I was barely eating, barely sleeping. I wasn't talking to anyone or doing anything social like everyone else I know in my class. I, I, I was freaking out. It felt like everything everyone had told me was coming true. Perhaps I didn't have what it takes to succeed. My self-confidence was already shot before I started medical school. And it just became worse. And I became more and more anxious. The faculty members at my school even noticed how from the beginning, I didn't talk much in our group discussions. And when I did, it was with a hushed voice and with great hesitancy. I mean, I was surrounded by such incredibly intelligent people. And I was over here dealing with my wheelchair, dealing with uh, this whole entire life, and the fact that everyone was looking at me differently, or so I thought. I was once again coming close to what I feared most, failure. I remember one night in particular, I wasn't doing well that block, and I was up late studying. And somehow, I, I fell in my bathroom onto the tiled floor. At the time, I wasn't strong enough to get back into my chair. So I remember crawling and using my arms, scooting myself all around my apartment while dragging my wheelchair trying to put it somewhere where it was more steady, trying to get so I can get more leverage to hop back in. I finally got into it after multiple attempts. But I remember thinking to myself, I, 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 I shouldn't be doing this right now. I need to be studying. No one else in my class has to deal with this. So 
So in this dark moment when I was pulling my hair out, asking the heavens, why me? What am I supposed to do now? I had an epiphany. If I could survive those months in the hospital, then I could survive anything. So from that moment, I became stronger, both physically and mentally. I adapted. I learned. I realized that what I was doing wasn't working. I couldn't just stay up late studying. I couldn't force myself to memorize things like I had my whole life. So I eventually you know, accepted it and you know, let go of my pride and saw a neuropsychologist. After a very lengthy neuropsych testing, I discovered that I wasn't incompetent like I once thought. I was actually very competent and perhaps just as intelligent as before. I read everything I could from then on on the best ways to study, the best ways to learn. I gained control of my anxiety and these fears I had. I would have to approach things in a totally novel way. I started back from page one. I learned to connect very basic ideas to more complex processes. I learned to use memory techniques, memory palaces, um, just things to help me remember, and just with this new mind that was totally different. Well, I actually graduated and earned a medical degree, and somehow I ended up doing surprisingly well in all my medical licensing exams. That was my pathway to helping people, many of whom have weather storms similar to mine or worse. For example, one patient I met on the spinal cord injury ward at the VA who hadn't, whose goal was to just go outside. He hadn't been outside in over six months, and he promised me that once he got out there, he would buy me a cheeseburger. <laughs> I remember another patient on the oncology floor who had, just like me, had lived a very active lifestyle and was now 50 years old in great shape, and he was just diagnosed with a certain type of blood cancer and had to come to terms with it somehow. And so he would ask me how I came to terms with my, my disability, with my issues. Over time, I learned that, all these, that my crises and failures uh, taught me a few things I could use to help other people. I'm going to leave, with you, leave these three things with you about reevaluating, renewing, and rediscovering. First, Failure allows us to reevaluate everything that we've been doing. Is what I'm doing working? What's going on? What's wrong with what I'm doing? Is it helping me, helping me achieve what I want to achieve? These are the questions I ask myself. Unfortunately, a lot of people stop right there, and that's a big problem, because I believe the next step is perhaps even more important. Secondly, failure allows us to renew our thoughts. Maybe life isn't as foolproof as I, thought th as, as I thought it was. It's way more unpredictable than ever. I have to understand this, accept this, learn from this, and never be scared of this. For me, it was that I learned that I have to try, I have to abandon everything I knew and risk everything and try something new. Which brings me to my next point. Third, Failure allows us to rediscover our passions. Like a bad game of poker, our chips are all in, and we've lost. So then, what is it we really want? What is it that makes, it, makes everything totally worth it? For me, it was realizing that I, I wouldn't be happy doing anything else than being able to treat my patients and be where I am today. Even if I lost everything, I would use everything I have left to be here. I found that I connected with my patients in a unique way. Although everyone's situation is different, I too had been there. I had seen the bottom. Failure and crisis does not have to stop the momentum in your life. Failure gives us time to realize what our weaknesses are and allows us to harness our strengths. It is by finally starting from nothing and making something better out of ourselves that we end up creating something of true value, bigger than if we had just sat back and accepted mediocrity. 
I had to lose everything to be the doctor I am today. Now, I'm not saying that we should proactively try to fail, because that's just ludicrous. Without trying and giving, every, giving it everything we've got, yeah, we would never fail. But we wouldn't know what it takes, both internally and externally, to succeed. If you haven't failed, that may simply mean that you haven't tried anything hard enough in your life to fail. You haven't left mediocrity behind. So no matter how scared I was about living alone and starting medical school with this new mind and this new body, I had to risk everything. And when I was in medical school, and I felt like I was losing everything and everything was going against me, I had to change everything again by reevaluating, renewing, and rediscovering. Because our best memories, our most influential and profound accomplishments, these are not created by simply sitting back and staying in our comfort zones. They're, by, they're created by risking everything and stepping out of our, where we feel safe with a complete acknowledgement that we may fail. I choose not to be def defined by my failures and perceived weaknesses. We all have this choice each day. Choose wisely.